gentlemen, to the Gwyn Petty Memorial Lecture. The Gwyn Petty Memorial Lecture is organized each year by the University of Third Age, Probus, and Putco Museum and Historical Society. This year, it has been arranged by Putco Museum and Historical Society. One of the first lectures I attended was 10 years ago, and that lecture was given by Gwyn on the Battle of Waterloo. Falca. Sorry, Battle of Falca, sorry. <laughs> He's no yes, sorry, sorry. The Battle of Falca, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if Gwyn were here today, then I believe that one of his lectures this year would be the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> How fitting then that this lecture is the Waterloo story. I know that Kerry has put a lot of research into this, and she has read nearly every book on the subject. I have also been on the receiving end of every bullet she's fired. <laughs> <laughs> so please give a warm welcome to Kerry on the platform. I must admit, I have spoken to larger crowds, but they were under 16 and they were in a school hall. You have thrown me a bit. I have never spoken to such a large adult audience. I would just like to say this. He forgets the Battle of Trafalgar. And yesterday, I bought him that new tie. And it's known as the Trafalgar tie. I mean, what more can I do? <laughs> Well, as I say, the Waterloo story, and I oh, have spent a long time. Before uh, Christmas, I didn't know anything about this, except Wellington, uh, Napoleon, I'd been to Waterloo, I'd seen the Lion Mound, and like everybody else, I watched the film. Well, four months later, I am now going to tell you things possibly you don't know. Because it's such a huge subject, I will be missing things out that you might know. I can't cover everything or we'll be here for four days. And you know I'm well capable of that. <laughs> right, so we kick off. The Waterloo story really is the cause of these two people here. They are the instigators of the whole thing. Has anybody worked out who they could be? The man on the left is Carlo de Bonaparte and the lady on the right is Cecile Letitia. They lived in Corsica in a place called Angiatio and they gave birth to a son. <laughs> Napoleoni de Bonaparte. He was born a year after the French had acquired the island of Corsica. His native tongue was Italian. The year before, he would have been a Genoan, because Genoa had owned, uh, had governed Corsica for 200 years. But if that had happened, if he'd been born a year before, we still wouldn't be standing here. He'd be Genoan, but he was French. Now, his father was, a, was of the lower aristocracy in Corsica and had a job uh, in, you could say, the French, it wouldn't be an embassy, but it would be a sort of liaison with France in Corsica and travelled to Paris quite often. Now, because of his links with the French hierarchy, he was able to send his sons to Paris to the military school. And he sent Joseph, the eldest, and Napoleon. Napoleon, he did very well, but not as well as he wanted to in the first year. He came 28th out of 42. And he thought, I'd better pull my socks up here, which he did. And in the end, he... Uh, graduated out of the College of Briand as a second lieutenant and he had specialised in artillery. Now remember that because that is very important when it comes to Waterloo itself. After that he went home to course because suddenly his father died of stomach cancer, which is a, an old man you could say for the end to come. But then in uh, 1793 he went back to France and it was in the middle of the reign of terror. And he got involved in the military, and he moved his way up with the Robespierre brothers at the helm. And of course, in the end, the reign of terror came to an end 12 months later, and he, Napoleon himself was imprisoned as a Robespierre sympathizer. But he got out of prison, obviously, and stayed with the military in France, 
and rose up through the revolutionary wars. Of, they were the French Revolutionary Wars. And many people say, well, when did the French Revolutionary Wars finish and the Napoleonic Wars start? Well, I can tell you. 1799. Because that's when Napoleon and two other people <coughs> took over a coup d'etat of France. And he made himself first consul. In 1802, he confirmed his position as the only consul, top man in France. In 1804, he crowned himself Emperor of France. And you know the rest. He built his empire. Now he married, by the way, you're all going to say Josephine was his wife. She was to start with. She was his first wife. He married her in 1796. She was six years older than him and already had two children. And like, I suppose, Henry VIII, he began to feel his mortality and wanted a dynasty to come after him. So in 1809, he divorced Marie Antoinette, uh, sorry, Josephine, sorry, and he married Maria Louise of Austria in 1810. And they had a boy in 1811, Charles France. I think that's enough for Napoleon, you got the gist? <laughs> right? So I mean, right to the top, he's an extremely ambitious man. And there's some lovely photographs of him. And he was, no, he was known, he was the greatest general of the time. And he was known as a supreme strategist. I will tell you this, if he was a football team, he played 60, won 53 and lost 7. <laughs> and there he is. A remarkable man, adored by his soldiers. And he liked that duration. He liked to be important. He was that ambitious. Different to this man, who hated war. Duke of Wellington hated war. It was a means to an end. It was a means to get peace. He was respected by his men. He wasn't loved. He wasn't adored. But he was respected because he tended to be a little standoffish. He was six foot. He came from... An ability in Dublin, he was born in Dublin, and he wasn't much, he, he was a lazy lad, to be honest, and his parents sent him to Eton, as you do when you've got lots of money. And, well, he, was, he didn't do much, to be honest, but he loved playing the violin, and really all he wanted to be was a musician. But that wasn't good enough, they wanted a bit more out of him. So they enrolled him in his uncle's regiment, the 33rd, in obviously the army. And with his uncle, he went to Gibraltar. Well, he seemed to have quite a, a flair for this. And he came home and he quite liked it. So off he went with his uncle again to India, where he made a name for himself. 1803, he had done so well, they made him a general. Not only did they make him a general, they knighted him as well. So Arthur Wesley. Wesley, their name was. But the more, as he got more important, that he changed it to Wellesley, that sounded, you know, what the crust. Anyway, he then went to be governor of Ireland for a couple of years. He was an MP and he went over to Ireland, but the Peninsula War came. There was no way he was going to stay away from the military for long, and he ended up going to Portugal to defend Portugal against the invasion of the French. <coughs> and they sent him over there with a little army, and by 18, from 1808 to 1813, football team played 41-40. This man was unbeaten. And he, was, he had studied strategy. He, one of his greatest uh, uh, idols was Alexander the Great. And he studied everything. But he is the greatest defensive tactician of his age and he was the second best general before Waterloo. They were the two greatest generals in the world. Right, I think you've got him. Con consummate tactician. The one thing his men said about old nosy, they called him old nosy, see, because he had a long nose, <laughs> was he may not talk to you, but he looks after you. And he did, he cared about his men. Napoleon, on the other hand, suddenly said to Napoleon, we've lost a lot of men in this battle. Don't worry, he said, the women of Paris will, will breed uh, a million more. He had no 
It was ambition to him. And yet the people adored him. He was very charming. Anyway, the third man in our story is Blucher. General Blucher. Now, Napoleon and Wellington were the same age at Waterloo. They were 46. This man was 72. He had been born 1742 in Mecklenburg, north of Germany, uh, almost in Sweden. And he started his career in the Swedish army. But he was captured by the Prussians, who kept him, and he stayed there, and he worked his way up the ranks. There's nothing more I can say about him except the fact he didn't get anywhere during the reign of Frederick the Great, because this guy was a little bit of a... He liked a good time. If the boys were having a drink, he had a drink. If there was anything wrong going on, he was in the middle of it. And Frederick the Great said, that man, I don't want him near me. Well, thank God, Frederick the Great eventually died, and this man did make something of himself in the Prussian army. We will go on with his story, and because he was called Captain Forwards, because he always led his men, so he had said, come on, boys, let's go. Even at one of the battles where he fell, he dug his uh, wounds in brandy and drank the rest. <laughs> he was an incredible guy, absolutely, 72, and he was still going forward. He was, a, but he was a battlefield expert. Right, I think you've got their personalities. Right, well, you can't see this very well, it's just for you to know, it's a very bad uh, slide. But all those pink and yellow, uh, red and yellow bits are Napoleon's family's uh, uh, re 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 uh, regimes. This is where, if he, if he uh, conquered a country, he put a member of his family in charge. All right, so it's mostly Europe. And the bit in the middle was France, and he was in charge of that. All right, so Napoleon's empire was huge. But he thought it was, he could do better than he thought. Now, you've just been listening to the 1812 overture, which was obviously written by Tchaikovsky, because Napoleon extended himself. He thought he could go and get Russia. And he went into Russia with half a million men, and he left Russia with nearly just about 50,000. It was the end of the Grand Army, because that was the name of his army then. Well, he retreated from Moscow and had to go back to lick his wounds. Well, obviously, he was weakened now. So now we have the sixth... Now, every time people took Napoleon on in the last, you know, the previous ten years, different countries would, would uh, uh, go together. They'd be called coalitions. And the sixth coalition was Austria, Prussia, and Russia, and Sweden. And they took on Napoleon at Leipzig, and they beat him. And that's very decisive, a very decisive thing to know, because from this, he had to retreat back to Paris. They pushed him back to Paris. All right. And on the 4th of April, 1814, he had to resign. And he abdicated in favour of his son. Now, his son was only two years old, three years old, and he was actually in power for two weeks. So he is, in the history books, he's known as Napoleon II. But he never actually was crowned, but just for you to know. Because he had to get up as soon as his father had to get up. So, here we go, Elba. So he's taken to Elba. Now, the night before he goes to Elba, he goes for a walk in the garden. And there's a little boy there, and he gives him a posy of violets. And he says to the little boy, I'm going to be like the violet, he said. I'm going to be shy and retiring when I get to Elba. And he took these posies. The next morning he went out and he looked to see where the boy had got them from, so just before he left. And there was a grenadier guard in the garden. And he said to him, they will be back next year, he said. And he said, do you think I will be back next year? And the grenadier guard said, I hope so. Oh. So on the boat, on the way to Elba, he made a speech and he said, I will be back when the violets are again in bloom. So I want you to remember that. Anyway, here's Elba. He was sent to Elba, this Elba, it's nearer to Italy than it is to France, which is very, you must know that for a reason in a minute. Also, he is now in charge of 11,000 subjects. He had been in charge of 44 million. But he's got 11,000 and he was promised 2 million francs to run this island as governor. He could keep his title as emperor. Okay, fair enough. So he got there in April. The two million didn't show up, even though he started to make some reforms out there. 
Josephine died in the May. And that broke his heart, because even though he was married a second time, the love of his life was Josephine. He had heard that Louis the uh, 18th was doing nothing. People were very unhappy about it. And they wanted the violet back. Because the secret code was, you'd say to somebody, you'd go, Emmy vous la violette? Emmy vous la violette? And if somebody went, we, oui, they were a supporter, they were a Bonapartist, and if they said, what? They were a, a royalist, a born, a, a born bonapartist. Right, so that's Elba, and he thought, well, I'm not stopping here. I can't, you know, he'd heard bad things about France, he wasn't getting anywhere, he was bored, because he was easily bored. By the way, there's his home. It's a beautiful, we'd love that, lovely summer house, but obviously it was not for Napoleon. And, after a while, my island is none too big. <laughs> right, so what did he do? Right, well, there was a man in charge of him called Neil Campbell. He was put there by the British government to look after Napoleon. But Neil Campbell had a bit of a problem. He couldn't leave his mistress alone in Genoa. So he has to go back and forth, he used to go back and forth seeing his mistress. And he used to say, Napoleon's no problem. He is resigned to his fate. And back and forth he'd go. Well, Napoleon, whilst he was gone, was hitting out these ships. The Inconstant and two others, he's given a new copper bottoms. He, you see, he'd already taken, on the island with him, he had taken some of his grenadier guards with him. There was a Corsican light infantry with him. Okay, and some Polish lancers. And there was, that's 1,026 men. Anyway, he got them on the boat on the 26th of February, and they left Elba. Round the corner comes Neil Campbell. Can't find him anywhere, because he'd been, you know, over in Livorno, meeting Madame. And he said, oops. <laughs> no sign. No sign of him. Right, where was he? There he was. He had arrived at Cannes because they went all looking around Italy for him. And he was in Cannes. He arrived in Cannes on the 1st of May. He got off the boat on the 1st of May. March, you know, all the marshals, no, Louis XVIII, you can imagine now. Oh, God, his man is back. And people are really pleased about this. And he, Marshal May says to Louis XVIII, do not worry. I will bring him back in an iron cage. Other men said, do not worry, I will shoot him. You know. Anyway, and that's exactly off they go, and he says to them, here I am, shoot me. So they all joined him. <laughs> so he had a thousand getting off the boat at Cannes, he had 60,000 by the time he reached Paris, because people came to his side. All the violent supporters, you could say. And there he is, he entered Paris on the 20th of March, 1815. And I just want, you may not see this at the back, but this is uh, the quote saying he had arrived between 8 and 9 o'clock the evening before, but then made a grand entry as he would on the 20th of March. And the person who wrote that was John Quincy Adams, who was later to be President of the United States. He had to be in Paris at the time. Right, so there we have now, just before we move on, the Violet. To commemorate this return, they made this card. Now, I don't know if you can see it. It's one of those puzzles. There's a face there. That's Napoleon. There's Maria Luisa. And there's the little kid. Charles Franz. And they made that in honour of his return. There we are. Right, now then. What about Welly? Right. Well, but when uh, Napoleon was put on Elba, Wellington was... Oh, by the way, the first thing he did was make him Duke of Wellington. <coughs> Uh, and he was made the ambassador to Paris. And then to Louis XVIII's uh, new regime. And on his way to Paris, when he went over to take up this post in July of 1814, he went by the Netherlands. Because he had to, re uh, he had to check the uh, enforcement along the Belgian border. Anyway, he did this, and whilst he was there, he, made, he had to put up with this prince, this crown prince of the Netherlands, who we'll meet again, who's right pain in the neck, right? But he had to meet up with him. Anyway, he then gets to Paris, and he takes up residence in the house that was Napoleon's sister's house, Pauline. She had gone to Elba with her brother. 
So he took this up and made it the French Embassy, and it is the French Embassy to this day. By the way, on Elba, but I didn't tell you this, the Polish wife didn't go with it, and that one part of the deal. He married the Emperor of Austria's daughter. Now he's a commoner on Elba, he can forget it. He never saw her again. But his mistresses went over, you'd be pleased to know, he was all right. He was kept warm. Right, so now you've got the Congress of Vienna, which convenes in September of 1814, they decided to do with Europe, because the Poli has completely changed it to what it had been. He has united some states and made them into countries, like the Netherlands. It's now Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg, before it was just three set uh, countries. And therefore they have to work out how they're going to put monarchies back, because all of Napoleon's relations have now been taken off the frogs. And now what's going to happen? And there they are, discussing all this. And if you notice, there is a Duke Wellington. Because by September, by January of 1815, he's had to go from Paris to Vienna, because Cassaray had to go home. So he's there, okay? So there they are, they're all there. And on March the 5th, a man comes in and says, the devil has been unchained. In other words, Napoleon's gone, they can't find him anywhere. He went, you know, come on, you know? Well, anyway, on March the 13th, they declared war on Napoleon. Not on a country, it's the first time ever they declared war on a, on a person. They were able to put everything in place very quickly because all the, the heads of Europe were there. And they turned to Wellington and they said, will you be the commander in chief please, of your allied forces that are now going to take on Napoleon? And he must have said yes. <laughs> right, so, this is it. The allied forces were going to be Prussia, Russia, Austria, and allied force, including Britain, the rest of the, sac of the German states, plus the Netherlands. And it was going to be 150,000 from each. Britain's little army, the 150,000, we didn't quite make it, I'm afraid, we didn't make that many. We didn't have any money, we'd spent it all fighting Napoleon in the first place, in the Peninsula Wars, was paid by the Rothschild's family. We had a, they, they got that for us. Right, so you've got now, they told him, Wellington, we want you to go down and stop Napoleon. Right, we're coming now eventually to the Battle of Waterloo. You've got the scene, haven't you? So, when, uh, because in those days, aristocratic men, they usually joined the military because they could buy commissions and they could make themselves a good career. And obviously the wives they married went with, the, went with them many times. And this is why society was in Brussels on the 15th of June. Now there's four days, they always called the Battle of Waterloo the four days. The 15th, the 16th, the 17th and the 18th. Well, on the 15th, there is a ball in Brussels run by the Duchess of Richmond. In fact, she had said to Wellington, do you think we should have this ball before such a, an event? Oh, yes, he said. He was a one for the ladies' mind. I was saying to Paul, yeah, I think of the two, I, I would like to think Wellington. Good-looking guy, very charming with the women. Not very good to the men, but very charming. <laughs> and he wanted this ball to relax his men. Thomas Picton was at this ball. All his top generals were at this ball. And they all go, you know, nice heavy dance. When all of a sudden, Napoleon has crossed the border. Right. He didn't expect this, you see. He thought that was going to be, you know, at least another day. Because Wellington always liked to organise where he was going to have a battle. He always had to plan it. And this man, Napoleon, caught him underway. And he says, Napoleon has humbugged me by God. He has gained 24 hours march on me. Straight away, he said, right, uh, I want to have a little word with my men, because he never got flustered, always calm. So he had a little word, and he said, now we're going to go from here soon, and we're going to do it in an orderly fashion. I'm going to have a little lie down now for two hours, <laughs> and I will see you tomorrow. So he gave them their orders, and that was that. And he was always very unflustered. But I don't think everybody was, because this guy here still got his dancing shoes on and his silk stockings. <laughs> and that's the whole lot heading down to where the first map is. Catra Bra here. Now, they're up in Brussels, right? That's where they are. This is the road from Brussels to Chalois. Now, Napoleon was in Chalois. 
Now, Napoleon, Wellington was caught for another reason, because he didn't know whether Napoleon was going to come straight back to Brussels, because that was Napoleon's aim, or he was going to come this way and cut off the British es uh, escape to the coast. That's his escape. I think he just got caught, to be honest. Because Napoleon realised, because they had spies in those days, by the way, he knew that the Austrians and the Russians weren't anywhere near. And he knew the Prussians and the British had turned up and thought, here's my chance. I'll beat these two before the others arrive. Common sense. So his aim, Napoleon's aim, was to meet the Prussians at Ligny, send Marshal Ney, Right, the bravest of the brave, as it is his title, right, with 40,000 men to capture Bra, to hold the British, or even beat them if he could, well, the Allied forces, sorry, not the British, so that the two could never meet. And the aim was that Napoleon would completely annihilate the Prussians and then go and help Ney with the British, or Ney would beat the Allied British and go and help Napoleon. That was, the, that was the plan. And he'd also asked Derlon, one of his uh, marshals, to go behind the Prussians so they couldn't escape. So they were completely cornered. And that was the plan. Okay. And there's the Battle of Ligny, right? Uh, there's Bucher leading his men. So it's, it's, it's famous today for a, for a windmill, so I put that there. But this guy here, nice now, he was Blucher's second in command and he didn't trust Wellington because apparently there'd been an agreement that if uh, Blucher was in trouble, Wellington would come to his aid. Well, Wellington said, I couldn't come to your aid. I mean, fight, you know, I had to fight myself. But Nysena never believed this. And Nysena was the brains behind the Prussian army. Blucher was the personality. But Nysena was more like Wellington. Let's be calm, let's consider everything. But Wellington said to Nysena, apparently the day before, and he said, he said um, are you going to put your men on the reverse slope? Now, I have to explain this to you. It is very important. When, say I'm on the top of the ridge, okay? I'm on a ridge now. I know my, I'm going, this, that's the battle that's going to take place down there. I'm on my ridge. Re Wellington believed in the reverse slope. He used to hide quite a few of his men behind the ridge so that the enemy never quite knew how many he had. Right? It was a very clever defensive tactic. But he said this to Nice and I. He said, you're going to hide some men behind the ridge? He said, no. We let to see our enemy. Well, that did for them. Because Napoleon had the same strategy every time. He blasted them with his artillery because he was an artillery man himself and he called them his beautiful daughters. He loved his cannons. Then once he blasted them with the cannons, he would throw in the cavalry and the infantry. Okay? But this man, I'm not doing it. No. Anyway, let me tell you about Devlon. He wants him to go behind the Prussians. Well, he arrived too late. And the Prussians got away. Although they were annihilated, they, some of them got away. And this picture here, you can't see it very well, that is Blucher under his horse. The, pre the French cuirassiers actually jumped over Blucher when he was on the floor and didn't see him there. And he got away. And if Blucher hadn't got away, we wouldn't have won the Battle of Waterloo. But he did. He got away. And what happened after that? Napoleon obviously had won the Battle of Ligny. And the Prussians headed for Wavre. Now, Nysena wanted pr the Prussians to go home. He said, oh, let's go home. We've had it. Blucher, no, I have promised Wellington I will be there for his head, uh, to help him. Right, in the meantime, remember me telling you, Napoleon told Ney to go to Catabram and fight the British? Well, when he got there, he thought, I've fought Wellington before, I can't see that many men. He had 18,000 men, by the way, at this point, and Wellington, the, England, the Allied forces, had 3,500. And because Ney, had been beaten by Wellington before in the Peninsula Wars, he was convinced that Wellington had them hidden behind a, a hill, behind a ridge, you see. So he hesitated, and this is the hesitation they talk about. They always say, oh, Ney hesitated at Waterloo. He didn't hesitate at Waterloo, he hesitated at Catrebra. Anyway, 
we go to capture bra. Now then, in the early in the morning, the three and a half thousand were made up most of the Brunswickers, the Nassas, and the Hanoverians. And they had to hold off, because Wellington was taking his time to come down from Brussels. And he got there about 10 o'clock in the morning. Thank goodness, because these were starting to crack, as you can imagine. And they had finally made his mind up to attack. But of course, by the time he attacked, Picton had turned up with the 5th Division. Right, now it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's how slow he was to make his mind up. Right? And Picton, we all know Picton, we'll come to him now in a while. He got into the Catabra, but didn't let anybody know. Right? And anyway, Ney starts the battle. And now we meet this William II of the Netherlands. He did for the Welsh. That is the flag of the 69th foot. They, all, they weren't given names then, they were given numbers. It, in other words, it was the 69th Regiment of Foot to be formed in this country. That's how they got their numbers. Okay? But they came, now you're going to ask, they came from Lincolnshire. How can that be the Welsh? Because they were amalgamated into the Welsh Regiment later in the 19th century. So I call them Welsh, okay? Well, this idiot here, William II of the Netherlands, right? I don't realise, but a square, right? You're in a, as in where you're all sitting, you were in what we would call a square formation if you were infantry, okay? You'd all have bayonets in the front and bayonets at the side. And the cavalry couldn't get in a square because you bayonet the horses. But if you're in a line, the cavalry can run right through you. Well, this is what happened. The 69th and the 33rd were sent in by Wellington to form a square because he could see Ney's cavalry coming. But this twit, he goes, oh no, we're going to line, make ourselves wider. 69th were completely annihilated and they lost their uh, emblem, you know, their what's the emblem? Uh, standard. They lost, the, they lost the standard. And to lose the standard is the biggest insult of all. So that's what happened to 69th, thanks to him. We'll come back to this again. Oh, and there comes Devlin. You know, he wasn't there in Lini. Remember, he was supposed to go behind the Prussians and he won there? No, because they had called him over to Catra Bra. By the time he reached Catra Bra, it was too late. So this poor Devlon spent the whole day going back and forth between the two with 15,000 men doing nothing. <coughs> okay? But anyway, the back of Catra Bra did not go the way Wellington wanted it to go. He wasn't there, he didn't plan it, he had to think on the spot, and did, in the end, he retired. He didn't lose it. And they certainly didn't win it. But Wellington realised this can't go on. And he had links with uh, Brucher. I said, well, he said to Brucher basically, will you be there for me at Waterloo? And he must have, not Waterloo, he called it Mont Saint Jean. And Brucher must have said yes. And it's on that premise, promise that Wellington decided to go back, right, to face the French at Mont Saint Jean. Right. So, what we've got now, he goes back to Mont Saint Jean. It's called the Battle of Waterloo, but it's actually in Mont Saint Jean. It's called the Battle of Waterloo because the night before, well, it stayed in Waterloo, the village of Waterloo. And he always called his battles by the place he had stayed the night before. Now, this Mont Saint Jean, well, you said you said, we go back to Mont Saint Jean. How do you want to know this? Would well, you remember me telling you he'd come down? When he first landed in France as the French ambassador, he came through the Netherlands to Paris. Well, on the way down, he noticed this piece of ground. And it was always his, uh, his habit. If he saw a place he thought could be a good battle, he used to say to a man, map that area for me. Keep a note of that. And this is what happened. He remembered this piece of land he had seen 12 months before. And he knew that he could set up his armies to do battle to his advantage on Mont Saint Jean. So he withdrew to Mont Saint Jean, but he didn't just say, come on, let's go. There was an awful lot of people injured in Catra Bra. You had, you had hospital trains going up there, you had artillery having to go up. This road was like a motorway, a congested motorway of wounded, dying, artillery, horses, all sorts. Anyway, they got up. And how did he, he wanted Napoleon to follow him, you see? He was golden in. Come follow me, come follow me. And Napoleon knew he had to follow him because the Prussian, the Russians and the Austrians were coming. 
So he had to deal with the Allied forces. That was his only chance. So that's how Wellington got Napoleon to Mont Saint Jean. Now, on the way up the night before, on the 17th, it absolutely bucketed down with rain. It was, it was the worst rain in history since Agincourt. Now, how do I know this? <laughs> because I wasn't, no, I it wasn't there. I read it. <laughs> the night before Agincourt was the most horrendous rainstorm. <coughs> and guess who won? We did. <laughs> um, this is what Wellington said. That's a good one. But this rain, I mean, you can't imagine going up this road, always dying, and everybody heads for Brussels, you see, all the wounded head for Brussels. But people, the soldiers haven't been fed for 24 hours, and most of these men had to have alcohol to face what they had to face. So the quartermasters used to give them out alcohol to keep them going. And they didn't have any of this, and they were soaked the skin, and they had nowhere to sleep. Some of them, when they got to Mont Saint Jean, were able to go into farmhouses and catch some chickens. Or, I mean, Thomas Jeremiah of the 23rd Wet Royal Welsh Fusiliers, Welsh, he writes, because he has a diary. You could write an answer. He doesn't know that. Right? But, uh, anyway, he writes in his diary that he went to this one cellar and two Germans had got there before him and were dead drunk. Absolutely dead. They had drunk so much, they killed themselves. But that's how bad it was. And one woman, who knew they were coming, got all her chickens together, went upstairs in the attic and locked herself into the whole of the battle. <laughs> because they knew the soldiers were going to forage, they had to live off the land. Even though Wellington said, don't do it, you don't want to make enemies of the locals. But they had to, they were starving. Plus they were soaking, absolutely soaking. Right, so the morning comes. Well, no, not really, as you can see. Well, <laughs> now the night before the battle, he's in his, in the inn in Waterloo, and this guy on the far left is Lieutenant Carmichael Smythe. Now, he says to Lieutenant Carmichael Smythe, where's those maps I wanted, that I uh, asked for last year? Carmichael Smythe, at this point, begins to sweat. I will see to it, he said, thinking, <laughs> he didn't know where they were. He had sent for them. He knew his, he knew Wellington would ask for them. He didn't know he would. But he, the man he sent to get them I could come with them. No, oh, the little guy who'd gone to Brussels to fetch them had got tipped that when all that road that was so full of people, well he ran into people, somebody had a go at him, he fell off his horse, his horse ran off. So he was frightened some bricking it, I said, somewhere. In the end, he found his horse in a field, and the map was still in it. Thank God for that. So when Carmichael says to Wellington, I'll go and see you, he said, and with that, Carmichael smiles, he's coming up the road, and of course he goes into Wellington and goes, there you are. <laughs> so he has his map, but this is how he covers everything. What a tactician. He thought of this look 12 months before. Anyway, the guy that helps him look over this map and plan their strategy is William Delancey. William Delancey is this young man here. He's the Deputy Quartermaster General. Deputy, why, where was the, where was the Quartermaster General? Well, he was the Hudson Lowe, and Wellington thought he was useless, and he didn't want him. Funny enough, the Hudson Lowe eventually becomes Napoleon's jailer in St. Helena. That must have been his punishment, I think, because Wellington had no locks on this man, and he persuaded this young man to come instead. And he looked after all the equipment and, and planned the whole battle that night before with Wellington. Right, and the night before Wellington is, he's, he knows that Napoleon is worth 40,000 men just being on the battlefield, and he has great respect for Napoleon. I mean, he's frightened, he's never met Napoleon before. They have never met each other. <coughs> William Delancey, we'll hear about more in, him in a while. Anyway, here is the battle field. We're in red, the French are in blue. Okay, now, the, he the aim of this battlefield, you don't have to worry too much, if you've got the ridge, right? So here's the ridge, I'm on the ridge. And I've got all my men most of my men behind here, and I've got men on top, but there are three bastions in Wellington's plan. There's the farm of Hougamont, over there by the coffee cups. 
Okay? There is La Haye Sainte, which is right here in the middle, and there is La Haye Farm over there by Paul. And he sells these with soldiers to, they're like bastards to, you know, to, to protect the front line. Got that now, Japan? It's taken me four months to get that. <laughs> right, now, on here you've got uh, infantry, artillery, and cannons. Now then, you can imagine. How do the infantry cope with cannon? They march at them. That was the plan, you march at. I will go into that. You won't believe what these men had to put up with. I just can't believe it myself. Right, so that's the plan. Now then, who come on to this farm over here, the one by the coffee cups? And basically, Napoleon is quite pleased with this, and he sends Jerome, his brother, and the Marshal Ray, to send more French into that farm, hoping that Wellington will come, will send more men over there, and therefore weaken this side of this battlefield, you see. Okay? So, Napoleon wants them all to go over there, so he can come round here. Yeah, we understand. yeah, everybody happy? Good, let's go. Oh, you're Napoleon's men. You just gotta know these. Nah, that's Marshal Ney, who, who couldn't make him, his mind about anything. There he is. And very headstrong. You're gonna hear about him. He certainly made his mind up at Waterloo, but he shouldn't have done it then. It was too late. You'll find out about him. Marshal Grouchy, now he's the one that Wellington gave the job, uh, Napoleon gave the job to. Go and when, remember the, Rush, um, the Prussians left Ligny and rushed to Vavre. He sent him after them and he said, Go with the Prussians, make sure they never come back. Right? So that was his job. You know that didn't work, but that was his job. Marshal Soult was the master, in, uh, was the quartermaster, you could say, for Napoleon. Now there was a man, oh, slippery as an eel. He was in the, he was minister of, uh, foreign minister, no, he was some minister for Napoleon. Then when the king came, he got into the king's good favour. Then when Napoleon came back, he got into the Napoleon's favour. Then when Napoleon was got rid of, we, he survived. He ended up being prime minister of France in 1840. <laughs> and he and Grouchy were the only two surviving commanders at Waterloo who went to Napoleon's film run in 1840. Because he was, I'll tell you that again. Right. And there is Comte Derlon. You know him, he you can't get it right, he kept going to Ligny, then you're going to Catabran. <laughs> well, he does distinguish himself at Waterloo. But just for you to know, these are Napoleon's men. Right. Remember I said, hold Hougamont? It is vital that Hougamont was held, you see. And there's the pictures, wonderful pictures. And this man, Lieutenant Colonel James MacDonald, the night, the morning before, Wellington was for, uh, surveying the battlefield because Napoleon was delaying things again. Why? Because it was soaking wet. The actual ground was terrible, it was muddy, it was like clay, it sucked everything in. And what was Napoleon's favourite weapon? The cannon. And it, they just, they wouldn't bounce, he left to ricochet his cannonballs, you see. Well, he just went, that was that, you know? So there wasn't much going to happen there. Plus, he couldn't get the cannons through the mud, so they had to wait. So he was down south of uh, the battlefield in a place called Le Pelou, suffering with hemorrhoids. <laughs> now, he had terrible hemorrhoids. Oh, they were to such a state, he had to put leeches on them every night. But the night before Waterloo, he couldn't find his leeches, so he's in a bit of a pickle. Right, well, this is why some people say he didn't he wasn't seen on his horse that often that day. Right, because he had these stem rights. He was always said it wrong with walk with uh, oh yeah. Anyway, so the battle seemed to be delayed and well turned a bit more time, so he went for a little horse ride with Marshal Fuch, uh, Mufflin, General Mufflin from the Prussian force and uh, to check if everything was okay. And they came to Hugamont and Mufflin said to him, do you really think you're going to hold this with 1,500 men? He said, you haven't met James MacDonald. <laughs> I told him you will fight to the last. You will not let this go. And Mufflin thought, fuck chance, you know. After back, at the end of the day, the same two men went past Hugamont. He was held. And he said to Mufflin, see you, don't do it. 
And that's true. Basically, that is true. Not the way he said it. I think he didn't speak like that. <laughs> anyway, now what you need to know here is at Hougamont, Marshal Ray, I told you, was given the job to attack Hougamont. Well, with him was Jerome Bonaparte. Give you a clue. It was Napoleon's brother. He had been the King of Westphalia and a general no good person. When Napoleon was on Elba, he was unemployed because he was useless. Because all he did was drink and play cards. His brother gave him some sort of focus in life, so when his brother wasn't around, he was useless. But he thought he was clever, you see. And he at Hougamont thought, because you see, the plan didn't go quite as Napoleon wanted it. Wellington didn't send too many of his forces there. Jerome kept sending plenty of French in there. So he depleted, and the, the back of Hougamont, they said at the end of the day, and the following day, the bodies of French piled up over the, outside the doors, where they had continued to try and get in, and the British just, you know, the Allies just mowed them down. It was unbelievable. And afterwards, the graves outside Hougamont, British graves, uh, sorry, the French bodies were burnt outside Hougamont in a big pile, and the actual pile didn't go out for eight days. And I don't put you off your tea, but that's what it was. <laughs> right, so the Hougamont was hell, and it was vital. Wellington himself said that, that won the battle. He said that in many things, mate, but that was well. Right, now, finally, Napoleon thinks he's been to see about his head rights, and he thinks now... We're going to sort things up. We're going to start my beautiful daughters, my artillery, 80 artillery, and now we're going to fire at the centre of Wellington's Ridge. Oh boy, did they fire. And they fired, and they fired. But as I said to you, they went. And the bumps in. Remember the people on the reverse side of the ridge? They went flying over half their heads. Oh, it landed by them and nothing happened. It didn't explode. There was a thing on the telly. They did a, a practice. They dropped um, they, a cannonball shot and it's supposed to explode on hitting the ground. It hit the ground and just buried itself. When... So you see, in that, that was a bit of luck. Napoleon's uh, ground battery was not as effective as he hoped. Right, so there we are. This is his, this is dead long. Remember him went everywhere and never got it right? Well, he's now being told with 32,000 men to attack. The Grand Battery didn't really do its job, but Ney is in charge now. <gasps> Where's Napoleon gone? He gone for a lie down. <laughs> he won't feel too good. The Emperor were back. <laughs> so he gone for a lie down. And he left Ney in charge, because Ney was second in command, just like the old Uxbridge was with Wellington. And Ney now, who was known for hesitating, decided, I'll show him mine, not going to hesitate. So he sends 32,000 infantry at the British cannons. But the weight of numbers started to tell they were getting through. And they took over the Haysant. The Haysant is the little farmhouse here. In other words, one of the bastions was going to fall. And as they came, this man stepped up. There he is, General Thomas Picton. He could see that the the infantry were coming through on the Haysant. He was in charge of the 5th Division, not a corps, division, a bit lower, and he piled in with his men. And as you know, he got shot in the head. He was the highest ranking officer to die at Waterloo, Lieutenant General Sir Thomas Picton. Now, Thomas Picton, just very quickly, in 1814, retired from the army. We now know he had post-traumatic stress disorder. He said he can't sleep at night, he can't face battles ever again. And when well, uh, Wellington was given this job, he asked Picton, he said, I need you. Because Picton had, be, had been so wonderful at the Peninsula War, he had made his name there. And Wellington felt, I can't do it without you. All right, so when, uh, Picton couldn't say no. But the day he left Pembrokeshire, somebody was digging a grave. And he, he lay in the grave and he said, this will do for me because I won't be back. He just knew I would never return. He was 54 at the time. He'd been born in Hill Street, Halford West, in the house of the Larne family. You know Larne Castle? Well, they were his family, friends of theirs. They were from, his family from Poston Hall, but his mother happened to be visiting the Larnes that day. And gave birth to Thomas. 
Thomas made his name in the, in the army, obviously, till in the end, uh, in 1794, he went to Trinidad and became the governor of Trinidad. But unfortunately, the government, he felt that the British government had not given him enough troops to run this island and therefore resorted to a lot of cruelty. One particular girl was uh, tortured rather too much and he was brought to the British courts in 1803 to face this charge of cruelty. And he was found guilty. But he took out, he made an appeal, like you do these days, isn't it? 40,000, uh, was it to get out of prison? Bail. He paid 40,000 bail to get out. And it went to appeal. It has still to be resolved. <laughs> In the meantime, the Peninsula Wars came and Pitton went to the Peninsula War. As I said, you made a great job of the, th of the whole thing. When he came home in 1813, he was, he was MP for Pembroke. And I was looking at the uh, House of Commons records. He wasn't officially taken off as MP for Pembroke until the 5th of July, 1815. That was three weeks after he was dead. Things didn't move quite too quickly then. But there he is, and he is the only Welshman to be buried at St Paul's Cathedral. And there he is getting shot. You know he wore ordinary clothes. He didn't have his uniform. He'd lost that. He was in a brown coat and a top hat. That is quite true. But the one thing people don't know is in Trinidad, he had this cruel like, uh, reputation. But he also had a wife. He didn't marry her, but you know what I mean. Because he never got married, you see. But with this girl out in Trinidad, he had three children. And the boy, in his will, was sent, they were all given money. And in his, the boy, through this money, came to Neath. And he qualified as a doctor. But on the way home, he caught cholera and died. But uh, just for you to know, he did have a family. Anyway, he was, and this is what Wellington said of him. A, fa a rough, foul-mouthed mouth devil, as you, you know, has ever lived. But when he died, he said he died gloriously. He had a great respect for the man, even though he didn't like him. Right, and then you have the other man. Now what happened, I uh, told you, Picton saw this gap in the hay scent and this infantry coming through, and he stopped it, he plugged it, even though he died himself. At the same time, Henry Padgett, who's in charge of the cavalry, he's in, in charge of the cavalry corps, realises it's time to bring out the cavalry and charge this infantry now of the French. And attack they did. Well, just before we move on, Henry Exbridge was from Tranvaya PG, uh, and he was the MP for Carnarvon at some point. But, this is what you want to know. He was married, first of all, to Charlotte Villiers, and he had eight children. In 1810, I think it was, he ran away with Wellington's brother's wife, <laughs> who he married, eventually, went to Waterloo, got his leg blown off, and then fathered another ten children. <laughs> and became governor of Ireland and Marquess of Anglesey, of course. But that is expert, and there he is with his leg. You know, this is, he's at the back, well anyway, we'll get to there in a minute. So this is about half, quarter past two in the afternoon, and he sends in the cavalry. Right, because he doesn't have his leg blown off till later in the day, you see. Okay, so we won't take that story now. Okay. And part of his brigades, part of his cavalry corps, is the Royal Scots Grace. And at quarter past two, they all go charging at the enemy, and the cavalry, and, and the artillery, the German guns. And somehow, the Royal Scots Grace get through. And they come in, in front of the 45th of line. We call them 45th foot. The French call them 45th of line. Infantry unit, okay? And he comes there and Charles Ewart, who's six foot four, on his horse, sees the standard of the 45th, picks it up, and makes his way back. Obviously, a lot of these men got killed, but they captured the 45th. And because they captured the 45th, Waterloo is on the badge of the Royal Scots Grace. Gentlemen here, you, Callaghan. He served with the Royal Scots Grace uh, about 20 years ago, I take it, yeah? And my grandfather, but I couldn't believe this, was in the Royal Scots Grace. 
And you can see Waterloo is on their badge. And it's through this moment when they, they tried everything. I mean, a lot of them got killed, but they made their reputation here, the Royal Scots Grace. And that painting is by Lady Butler, and as you know, it is extremely famous. But it was all part of pushing the French back. Because Napoleon was winning. He had still had more men to come through. You see, his imperial guard, his grenadier guards, his cream of his army that had seen him through everything was still to come into the battle. They were at the back in reserve. Don't forget, he's lying down with his piles. Don't forget that, right? So Marshal Ney is in charge of the French at this point. Oh, we understand that bit now. Right. And he realised, he thinks now, right, the British are starting to gain. I send the cavalry in now. And he got them all lined up. Right, 5,000 cavalry, and he charged the hill of the British. Uh, allies, you know what I mean. Anyway, he got through. It was a terrible battle, as you can imagine. And, but the, the cannons, the canisters, because the, the allies also had canisters, which shot, like musket shot. You know, the, the cannon would shoot the ball, the ball would split into lots of shot, and then it would hit everybody. So that this was a different weapon again. And the French had to face this. But he kept sending them in, he kept sending them in. But when they got to the other side of the slope, because he thought they'd got through, there were 20 squares waiting. And that's what was wrong with Ney's attack. Because what he did, he met 20 of these and his cavalry was completely beaten. They all, and what they said is that there were so many horses and men coming at the 20 squares on the reverse slope that they were just piling on top of one another and really now becoming protection to the squares behind. And they, and of course, where was Napoleon? He finally wakes up and they go, what the heck's going on here? See, if he didn't have his pile problem, he wouldn't have been in this... In the pickies, would he? And at half past four, the first Prussians arrive at Plastoir. And Plastoir is down here. So it's behind the French. So now Napoleon's come out just in time. He has to now employ 30,000 of his guards here to fight the Prussians. But he's still got enough to go that way, if you understand what I mean, yeah? So they keep fighting until half past seven at night he sees the other Prussians arriving on the, west, on the east. You know I just showed you from the top to join Wellington and he knows now this is it. I've had it. I can't face these. He has to send his Imperial Guard in. And there's the Imperial Guard. They are the creme de la creme. They are, I mean they are the best fighters in the world at this time. And he sends what he has left in. And as I was telling you, they marched against the cannon. And the British cannon, the Allied cannons, were was firing at them, and they kept marching. Didn't, you know, just kept marching and marching till they went over the top. They thought they'd made it. With that, Wellington gives the order, and all his infantry stand up, and they face a red wall. And the, the guns start firing. We use rifles, by the way. The French use muskets. Rifles are more accurate, and therefore the French, you no, know, these guards suddenly saw this red wall firing at them, and they turned and ran. Guess who won? <laughs> no. There we are. Now, there's the last attack. The last attack is Napoleon saying to Sir Hussey Vivian, the brother of John Vivian of Patolbat. Go on, boy, you can chase them then, because he'd been waiting to go at them. And down they went, chasing the guard as fast as they could. But some of the guard turned and faced them. And the last two men, two of the last men to die that day, were Major Frederick Howard from Castle Howard and Lieutenant Samuel Farrier from Pembroke. Because they got caught in the French square, because they were on horses, you see? The Tenth Hussars, they were. The 10th Hussars means the 10th Light Cavalry. It was a posh word, Hussars. <laughs> right, so there we are. When it turned well, what a shock, isn't it? The one thing I've got to say, when I said that red wall came up in front of the, the Imperial Guard, what I didn't say to you was, 
They were, the British were almost scared to death when they saw these grenadier guards because they were so tall and they, ne and they nearly turned and ran. And it was at that point that Wellington came behind and shouted, forward. And because he was their leader and he had been in the 33rd himself and it was his regiment in front, they turned. Now also in that group were the first lifeguards, who today are called the grenadier guards because that's where they got their name from fighting the French Grenadiers. Actually, it was wrong because when they looked at it, it was the Chasseurs, but that's where they got their name. <laughs> I don't care anything at the moment. <laughs> right, after the battle, well, the ground it said, the whole field from right to left was a mass of dead bodies. I mean, the whole battlefield was three miles by two. Right? And throughout the four days, 200 men had got killed, and there's about 70,000 men thrown across this battlefield. Three miles by two. I mean, they were on top of one another. Just remember, these cannons blew their heads off. They blew the horses' heads off. You had arms, legs. You had all sorts everywhere. I mean, the, the smell must have been horrendous. The blood was, you know, was unbelievable. But there it is, this battlefield. And this is what happened. At night, at night, the very night, the 18th, scavengers moved onto the field to plunder the dead and wounded. And if the wounded resisted, they were killed. And the scavengers, I'm afraid to say it, were the Prussian uh, stragglers. You see, when you won a battle, your booty was what you gained. So if we win, you take. And they took a lot of stuff off the dead bodies. So did the locals. Men and women, I'm going to love this one. The men, some men and women, went around pulling the teeth out of the dead, made dentures and sold them as waterloo teeth to the rich. Because there weren't any dentures, you see, or worth having. Of course, the locals also picked up as many muskets and souvenirs because they knew they could sell them, you see. There's all these dead bodies there. Well, they burnt the French bodies, as I explained to you at Hougamont, and they buried the Allies. And the Allies were buried in the ground around Waterloo for many years if they were buried properly. If they were very shallowly uh, buried, the bits started to show through a finger of scale. So a year later, it was decided by the commission out there that they would dig up all the, the bodies that were uh, in shallow graves and grind them into fertilizer. And they used that for their fields. This is what they did. Now, you, you think of this now. Don't forget the road to Brussels is full of the dead, the wounded, the, and people are dying on the way, and the smell, and the bloated horses, and the... Well, I can't go into it. You'll be off your tea. But, if you're not already, medicine. What about the doctors, then? Well, there were 2,000 amputations at Waterloo. The officers, they were taken to the rooms at Waterloo Village, where Napoleon had been the night before. And it was into one of those houses that Lord Axbridge was carried, because at, at half past seven in the night, you see, a cannonball came and went and said to him, by God, sir, you've lost your leg. And he went, good grief, so I have. <laughs> and they carried him to a house in this Waterloo Village, and they say of Lord Axbridge, Sir John Hume, that's the man there, that's the surgeon, Took his leg off, right? He didn't have any anaesthetic. And in fact, John Hume was hesitating. He said, what's the matter? You know, get on with it. And apparently they took it off and the sword got stuck. And he went, ooh. <laughs> and then eventually they got the leg off. And they said, no word of a lie. They took his pulse and it was 66. Lord Duxbridge, incredible man. And they buried his leg in the garden, right? And they gave it a little tombstone. My leg. No, I didn't. No, it's just... No. They did bury it in the garden, right? And I'll explain you in a minute what happens next. Right. There's the glove and the saw that did the job. Right? And don't forget, this was happening. They were... The people had gone to Brussels, right? There were three... There were 3,000 dead in, within four days. They got to Brussels and they couldn't get in. And they died on the castle walls. On, on the town wall. 
They're everywhere still, because in Brussels, people, were, ordinary people would take them in, and on their house they'd put how many men they had, so the doctors would know where to go. I mean, it's, that's the blessings. Three blessings, two, uh, four blessings, and so on. That is a picture of a gunshot in a femur bone. I can see Doctors Parry at the bar. <laughs> and this guy here is the French surgeon. Now he was more, he was ahead of his game. He was a better, because he'd been with Napoleon for most of the time, he already had, had created these field ambulances where uh, they'd come on the horses straight to the battlefield and take off, uh, unfold a sort of a table behind and he would take the legs off and the arms off on the spot. Because he said, the sooner you do it, the, the person's in shock and they live longer. Whereas if you make them wait a couple of days, you know, they're, 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 they're down green is setting in, they're worrying, they don't live. I mean, one man came over from, uh, from England to help, and when he got to Brussels, there was, I don't know many men there, and, and the sooner he could cut their legs off, you know, somebody else wanted their leg cutting off, because they were all in a queue waiting. And 90% of them died. I mean, it, it was horrendous, the, 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 you know, the wounded and the dying after Waterloo. But I want you to take that in because the women and children had to be there. With some officers, their women, uh, uh, soldiers, the wives went with them. Four to six wives were allowed to go with every unit. And they looked after everybody else's washing and fed the men as well. But obviously, they were the two, you could see the two wealthy ladies. That is Mrs. Delancey. You've heard me show William Delancey was at the night. Um, Plot in the, the battlefield, remember the young man? Well, he was on his horse when a cannonball hit him in the back. And he went head over his horse and landed on his face and went and thought he was dead. He didn't die for six days. He had been taken to Brussels where his wife nursed him. And, and sadly, he died. They'd only been married three months. And when the autopsy, when they looked at him, that cannonball had taken every rib off his spine. The pain that young man must have died in. And this is Lady Smith. Lady Smith, South Africa. You heard of Lady Smith of South Africa? Well, she's the wife of Harry Smith. And she helped on the battlefield to help some of these soldiers off. But Jenny Jones is from North Wales. She went with her husband to the battle. And he was injured. And she took him, carried him off the battlefield and looked after him herself. There were, some, there were just people there, wives there to help. Do you know there were people there watching the battle that the Duke of Richmond came down with Wellington and said, do you mind if I watch? Yes, yeah, certainly, he said. And at three o'clock, he said, I've had enough now, I'm going home. But the women came with their men, some of them, as I say. Now, this is Martha Deacon. The story of Martha Deacon is so sad. She came with Catabra, this was, not Wellington, uh, Waterloo. She came with her husband and she was pregnant. And she had two kids. And she came to Catrebra, and at the end of the battle, she couldn't find her husband anywhere. And somebody said, we saw him, he was shot. Oh, God, you know. Anyway, she walked 22 miles to Brussels, where she found him. The baby was born on the day of the Battle of Waterloo, because Catrebra was two days before, if you remember. And they called it Isabella Waterloo Deacon. <coughs> Mrs. Peter McMullen, same type of thing. Her husband was an artillery gunner, and the gunner just, uh, backfired and took both his arms off. She looked after him. She was pregnant as well, and she had a boy then, and it was, his name was Frederick Waterloo McMullen, McMullen. People named their sons' daughters after the battle, you see, but the women, they were there. I mean, unbelievable what they went through. They went with their, their husbands, you see, because there was nothing else for them to do. And it was, it was a life, it was a, a career. Right, well in the evening, Wellington wrote his dispatch home. He had to tell Britain now what had happened. Now unfortunately, the Cumberland Hussars had, retreat, had um, deserted from the battlefield and had gone running into Paris 20, sort of 12 hours before saying, the French are coming, the French are coming. So everybody thought France had won. So that went through to Britain, and they thought France had won. So it took two days before they knew that Wellington had won. And it took two days because Wellington now was back to his Waterloo residence, 
in the village of Waterloo. And he apparently he, cri he cried. He cried after the battle. After every battle, he cried. He hated men. And you can see why. He says, I don't know what it is to lose a battle, but certainly nothing can be more painful than to gain one with the loss of so many friends. Anyway, he wrote this despatch. He gave it to Major Henry Percy, who came straight off the battlefield, took the despatch, went up to Ostend, went across, carrying the two eagles that had been captured at Waterloo by the two uh, Clark, captured the 105th, and you, Charles Hewitt of the Royal Scots Greys captured the 45th, and he sent Major Percy with these two eagles to tell Bathurst, the Foreign Secretary. Major Percy was still in his battle kit, as I say. Right, when he got to where Bathurst was supposed to be, he was there, so he ended up going to a ball. You know, always had these balls. And the king was there, and he just walked in carrying these. And the king, oh, you know, can imagine the elation in the whole of London. And the following day, the 22nd, there it is, it was in the Times. We won. And there was, you know, there was a celebration throughout the country. Now you must wonder who the heck this is. Well, that's Baron Rothschild. Remember I told you he funded the, um, well, Mr. Rothschild knew 20, he knew 18 hours before everybody else because he had his own little uh, runner. And what he did, he, saw, he bought chairs, you see, because <laughs> he knew what was coming. And then he sold some shit. You, you, you know, he wandered the market. He knew. And that's how he made more money. So he made that out of Waterloo. Right, well, Napoleon surrenders. He surrenders. He goes back to, you know, he, he goes back to Paris. In the end, he surrenders. And his, his aim is to get to America. He thinks, they look after me. Well, he was intercepted at Rochefort. And then the Prussians wanted him limb by limb. They wanted to kill him. Right? They hated him. And in the end, he thought, well, I'll throw myself on the British. You know, they're not as bad as the Prussians, sort of thing. And there he is. He came on to the HMS Belliferon. And there's the captain, Captain Maitland. He welcomed him on board. Whilst the powers of B decided what to do with him. And they took the boat, came to Plymouth Sound on the 26th of, uh, sorry, the 15th of July. And that's where it stayed for three weeks. And if you can see, if you, I don't know if you can see it, lots of little boats going out. That's just off Tor Bay. That, it, it was anchored there for three weeks. And Napoleon, between five and six, would come out to see him. Because he loved to be noticed. And everybody said, Napoleon's on there. And they'd come out their boats. And he, he was a real tourist attraction. You know, Tor Bay needs it today, don't they? You know, so there he was. Anyway, three weeks, it was called this one, by the way, the Blipheron, was the Billy Ruffian at Trafalgar. It had been a Trafalgar that boat. Anyway, the message came, you're not, you can't stay on this boat, we have now decided where you're going, you're going to St. Helena. Therefore, he was transferred to another boat called the Northumberland and sent to St. Helena, and he arrived in October of 1815. Right, St. Helena was a much smaller island, and that's where he stayed for six years, very unhappily, because Sir Hudson Lowe, remember the quartermaster general that went and didn't want, he insisted on calling him general, which he hated. He did spot a gardening, but it was usually at this point that he started writing his memoirs and creating his own image. Because a lot of things we read about Napoleon, he wrote himself. Okay? But just before I pass on from this, because he dies in the end of stomach cancer, just like his father, uh, in 1821. But before we go on, I've got to show this guy here. This is Tom Johnson. Tom Johnson, this is true, was paid £40,000 by a South American government to, in 1820, catch, you know, escape, help Napoleon escape via a submarine. <laughs> Honestly. An American in 1806 called Robert Fullerton had devised this very basic submarine. And therefore, this Tom Johnson, who was always up to something, he was British. And he, he was making one in his backyard, you know. I don't know how this happened in London. Anyway, his aim was to get through, imagine this, 12 gunships, 2,500 men and 50 cannons, and capture and help Napoleon escape. And the aim was to climb up the rock, have Napoleon dress in poor clothes, you know, like a peasant, come down in the chair, which he was going to fix up there, slip into the submarine, and off they go. 
Anyway, that's absolutely true. The submarine was captured in the Thames, done gone anywhere, and was burnt. But somebody said later, it would never have worked. And they said, well, of course it wouldn't have, you know. Well, of course he said it wouldn't have worked, the pony would never have put on peasant clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. St. Helena, that's true. Look up Tom Johnson, St. Helena. Right. Now then, this is what I can't get over. The day after the battle, the first tourists arrive. Uh-huh. Then they come, little nosegays, you know, don't want to smell any face, step over the bodies. Some are appalled, some think it's great, we'll go back a few times. Of course, the locals have already selling them stuff, making money. The inns of Waterloo are full. It's like a, an ex, you know. And within four days, it's battlefield guides. Still looking at the bodies. I mean, you know, the, the, what can I say? Except this is, I've got to read this bit, believe it or not. Right. On the 1st of July, Lady Exbridge visited to see where her husband's leg was buried. And she showed it was in the garden. And Monsieur Pagny, who owned this house, said, can I keep it? So she let him keep it, all right, and he could make money out of a tourist attraction. And of course, as you know, uh, Lord Uxbridge was given a wooden leg. In fact, he had three wooden legs, and he left them in different places, and one was obviously in Anglesey. Okay? Now then, these are the people that turned up following the Battle of Waterloo because it was the thing to do. In August, Sir Robert Peel... You heard of Sir Robert Peel? He came to see the battlefield. And it is said that the smell was just about going. It said the effluvia was horrible. People, the bodies were being removed, but stink was still there. So Walter Scott turned up in August of 1815, because he wanted to write a poem, you see. It, it, was, a, it was the muse, wasn't it? J.M. Turner turned up in 1817 to paint Waterloo. In October, the poet laureate, Robert Southey, turned up. In April 1816, Lord Byron came. In 1820, Wordsworth and Dorothy came. And everyone came. If they had money, they went to Waterloo to see the battlefield. Money was made, just like it would be today, in any entertainment. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? Oh, Waterloo, there's Wellington's tree. How nice for it to turn up. Now, during the battle, Wellington stayed under this tree. You know, it's famous for Wellington's tree. Well, through all the tourists coming, they took chunks out of it. So in 1822, the, the man who owned the land cut it down. And he sold it to a man called John Children, who made it into three chairs. Ah. And that's what he wrote on it. And there's one of the chairs. And that's Wellington's chair. One was given to Wellington, one to George IV, and one went to the British Museum. All right. So there you are. There's a chair. Oh, what happened after Waterloo? I told you. So, uh, oh, by the way, Lord Fitzroy Somerset was uh, Wellington's secretary during the battle. He later became Lord Raglan and led them all into the Crimea. Same man. Marshal Soult, as I said, he went into exile, came back very quickly and became Prime Minister of France. Grouchy went into exile and wasn't pardoned until 1819. Ney was the only commander that was caught and executed. And he was executed in uh, December of 1815. And really, he's not fair, he shouldn't have. But he didn't know enough people high up. He came from a very low class, Marshal Ney, and he had no one to save him and he, he faced a firing squad. He refused the blindfold, he refused to sit down, and put his, took his hat off and held it to his heart as they shot him. And he's the only one who was executed. And Devlon, you know him, I kept going round, couldn't get anywhere. He became the governor of Algiers. They obviously paid him off, putting him there. Bing, you've heard of Sir John Bing at the First World War, in charge of the Second Corps, I think it was the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, Son, well, his great-grandfather had been at Waterloo. Kent was the oldest man to die after Waterloo. He was 90. He was the oldest officer to live, 90. Okay? I think that was 1861. And Charles Ewart, the man from the Royal Scots Greys, he spent the next five years of his life going around with Walter Scott on reading tours. Because Walter Scott thought, you know, this will bring the people into you in my books, sort of thing. And hear my poetry. And that's what he did. He went around with Walter Scott. 
Thomas Jeremiah, remember the young man, 23rd Fusiliers, who went hooting for beer and uh, chickens the night before Waterloo? He became the Chief of Police of Brecon in 1837. <laughs> The legacy of Waterloo, where that big mound was built by the King of Orange, uh, the King of the Netherlands, William, for his son, the Prince, remember the Crown Prince? I told you the, the nut. Bernard Cornwall says, the best he wrote home this Prince to his father saying, my corps, my men, they, we won the Battle of Waterloo. And Bernard Cornwall says, no, what won the Battle of Waterloo was the French infantry man that shot him in the shoulder and got him off the battlefield. <laughs> But his father built that mound on in his where he'd been shot. So that mound isn't to remember men, it's to remember this man being shot. Okay? And by doing that, they changed the whole battlefield. And when, Walter, when Wellington went back years later, he said, What have they done to my battlefield? This man here, Henry Windham, was at Hougamont. He is Lord Egremont now, and he, for the rest of his life, could not live, sit in a room with shut doors because of the banging of that door at Hougamont, where they had to keep shutting the door to keep the French out. He lived on his nerves for the rest of his life. And in 1887, they finally reinterred the officers of Waterloo. They'd been in the ground for 72 years, and they put them in a mausoleum in Brussels. So eventually the officers were removed from the battlefield. So his body's still there today, in that battlefield, if they haven't been dug up by the farmer, obviously. And then we have a legacy, of course. There are 21 monuments to Wellington in this country. The one in Brecon, that is. Right? And there's one in Leeds with red wellies. And they paint his red wellies every year to make sure that they shine out. Right? There is to Picton. That's Thomas Picton's memorial at Carmarthen, apart from the pub in town. And that's to Uxbridge in Anglesey. And there's also one to, uh, Wellens has also got a memorial that looks very similar to that in Dublin. And it was 21. There are nearly 93 pubs in this country named after the Duke of Wellington. But there are more named after Horatio Nelson. But there are six named after Napoleon. I mean, what? <laughs> Right? So the legacy lives on. Well, and they say that the Battle of Waterloo shaped this country because it was the French did everything beforehand. It owned, you know, got governed Europe. It was the, but it was the Napoleonic Wars that, it, that sort of propelled our industrial age faster than we would have gone because we had to find the cannons and the guns to face the French. So the Industrial Revolution in this country it was really caused by the Napoleon, it not caused, but it was, it, you know, propelled. It, 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 it gained momentum much quicker than it would have done. And after the French were beaten, of course, who became the rulers of half a, of a quarter of the world? The British. It defined our, our image for the rest, for the next hundred years. And the last thing I want to say is it is that Waterloo was the first campaign, sorry, the first battle where a campaign medal was brought out. You know, we have these campaign medals today. Well, this is the Waterloo Medal. It was the first one of its kind campaign medal. Now, before we finish, I think we should remember, even though we've heard everything, uh, you've been very patient, and I think I've remembered most things. I could do more, but I don't want to kill you off. I think we should always remember that these men took part in this battle. Human people, you know, humans with emotions, with families, who felt pain, who felt loss. You know, we all talk about Waterloo as if it's 200 years ago, so they can't possibly have been like we are today, but they were. And I'd like to finish on this. This is written, right, um, sorry, off that one. I knew I got one, that's it, the end. This is written by Major Arthur Hayland. Now, every soldier, like they are today, was asked to write a letter to their loved ones should anything happen to them. And he wrote, My Mary, let the recollection console you that the happiest days of my life have been from your love and affection, and that I die loving you only, and with a fervent hope that our souls may be reunited hereafter and part no more. What, dear children, my Mary, I leave you, my Mariana, gentlest girl, may God bless you, my Anne, my John, may heaven protect you, my darling Mary, I must tell you 
Again, how tranquilly I shall die, should it be my fate to fall. We cannot, my own love, die together. One of other must witness the loss of what we love most. Let my children console you, my love, my Mary. Major Arthur Hayland was among the thousands who were killed at the Battle of Waterloo. voluntarily wanted to go with him. He went with a, an entourage of about 50 people, his friends. I don't know if you saw the picture, but they, they sat around him when he was dying. They looked after him. Yes, no, he wasn't. There were two and a half, sorry, there were two and a half thousand soldiers on the island. There were 12 gunboats. And this man, Tom Johnson, must go, why did South America do it? Because Napoleon had backed them against Spanish aggression. Because Napoleon's next move, once he got Russia, we know this to be a fact, was to move into South America. I mean, the world was coming, you know, it was going to be his oyster. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. So. Well, yeah. Uh, I think the Rothschilds have some association with France, and they had a base in Paris, but they don't know at the time. Well, that could be, well, once we've beaten the four, well, the other thing is, of course, once, no, you're quite right, they most probably moved into France. Mm -hmm. Because once, we, uh, Napoleon had left and the French government had acquiesced, you know, given in. We then had a, what they call it, um, a force, what's it, what they call it, a force that stays somewhere until... <coughs> occupation. Occupation of force, thank you. An yeah. occupation of force until November 1818. So three years we had an occupation of force there. So I wouldn't mind it better that the Rothschilds took advantage of this, because yeah. we were holding the city. Yeah, I would have thought that, yeah. <laughs> By the way, at the Congress of Vienna, we acquired Malta and Cyprus. Just thought you'd better know that. <laughs> Who executed Marshal Ney? Was it the French or... The French. They had the Louis XVIII, oh, by the way, Louis XVIII, when Napoleon came back, went to Ghent. He was so fat they had to wheel him round his garden. But obviously, when they came back, he wanted some sort of retribution. And Ney was the one they caught. He didn't catch any of the others. But they shot him. But everybody else, as I said, was reprieved. When uh, Napoleon was first on the, uh, after the execution of Louis XVI, which was like 50 years before, uh, Louis XVIII, right? And I wonder where's Louis XVII gone? But he was the little boy that died in the Tuileries, and out of his memory, Louis XVIII took the title XVIII. But he was looked after in England for 15 years in Hartwell House. Just thought he'd throw up in it. <laughs> It's all coming out, it's like diarrhea. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> With emeralds. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, and the other thing Wellington said, he went, well, I've got to tell you this, I knew I forgot something. He went, in 1840, they, uh, Napoleon had been buried in St. Helena. In 1840, they brought him home, and they buried him in Les Invalides in France. And I told you that Grouchy and Soult were the only two uh, officers left that went to this funeral, but so did Wellington. And he says uh, uh, to Harry Walter, he said, I can now say I am the greatest living general. But whilst he was there at a banquet, some Frenchmen turned their back on him. And the lady said, oh, how rude, she said. It's okay, he said. I've seen their backs before. <laughs> 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 Are there any other questions, 
the effect that the battle of the provision of cannon, a lot of them made it better. Right, taking that. Right, and that's a big deal. Right. Well, that Delos then made yeah. money on that, didn't they? Yeah. The, um... Once it's all finished, of course, the business event. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because there were four ironworks, weren't there? They were going full head for leather, but the only like a Bartha one survived in the end, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right now then. But there were four in Merthyr. There's a book that's probably the Great Hopkins, fairly recently, called The Iron Master. Right. And that's very informative about that particular part. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.